About 25 years ago, I was invited to join the Science and Religion Forum. It met at the University of South Africa. It consisted mainly of theologians and some professing Christian scientists. The aim was to find ways of interpreting scripture to fit in with the currently popular stories of science. I was alone in pointing out that science and its theories are full of unproved assumptions, guesses and suppositions. Its theories don't usually last long before they have to be drastically modified or need to be abandoned as false, as we saw in episode 77. On the other hand, the Bible has never been shown to be wrong by provable science. Everyone at the forum came to think of me as a renegade and after a year or two they stopped inviting me. The leader of the forum, a theology professor, then wrote a textbook. He devoted a chapter to pointing out what an idiot I am for believing what the Bible says. Sadly, there are many eloquent theologians today promoting the idea that science knows what it's talking about and the Bible does not. One of the most common perversions has been popular for about a century. It's usually called Lucifer's Flood. It appeared after geologists started claiming the Earth is millions of years old, far older than the Bible can allow. For centuries, the idea had never occurred to anybody. There was nothing to suggest it in the Bible. But many theologians respected the statements of scientists more than the statements of Scripture. So compromising theologians noted that the creation account of Genesis chapter 1 starts with the Spirit of God moving over a mass of water. The Bible tells us that the earth was, at that stage, formless and void. That reminds me of our clever mathematicians with their string theory. Their strings have the form of lines or loops, but they have no breadth or thickness, so they have no volume. They're void, but they do at least have a form in the mathematician's imagination. The earth at that time was void, and there were no mathematicians around to imagine a form for it. It did not yet exist at all. Verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, appears to be a heading like, this is the book of the generations of Adam in chapter 5, and these are the generations of Noah in chapter 6. The heavens were created on the second day, and the earth was created on the third day. But some cunning theologians decided that the earth being formless and void must somehow mean there was an earth in existence for vast numbers of years before the first day of creation. When Lucifer rebelled against God, which the story presumes to be some time before the creation, he flooded that pre-creation earth with water. Well, let's hear one of the proponents of this story tell us why we need to believe it. I'm going to show you in Scripture where there was an earth that was destroyed and it was covered by water. And that that happened before the first day of creation. I want to show you that the flood of Noah was the second flood. Our universe is 94 billion light years across. And this, what we have right here, and quoting Science Weekly, this is a picture of the radiation left over from the Big Bang Theory is what they call it. It's not the television show, okay. And it was taken from a spacecraft. This is the oldest, this picture right here is the oldest light recorded in the universe. Now this information that they have helps them determine the age of the universe. Now the leading explanation 
about how this universe began was 13.8 billion years ago. He's telling us a story about cosmic background radiation coming from a Big Bang. And this proves conclusively that the Earth is more than 13 billion years old. The picture he shows is a failed attempt to superimpose a pattern to make the story fit the Big Bang. We saw in episode 46 that astronomers had to reluctantly admit that the pattern is make-believe, and the radiation is actually uniform to better than a thousandth of a degree. And that could not possibly be the result of a Big Bang. With even higher accuracy, they find an axis which aligns with the Earth's ecliptic. This was so devastating for the whole theory that it was called the axis of evil. Papers were presented in the scientific press admitting that the whole universe seems to align with this axis of evil, which shows the Earth to be the centre of the universe. This, by itself, is a complete wipeout for the Big Bang, together with all its times and distances. The Big Bang has been disproved by so many observations that in episodes 75 and 76, we saw scientists desperately looking for a new theory to replace it. So the reason this preacher gives us for believing his story has fallen apart. But he tells us he can prove his story by scripture. Like most Lucifer's flood proponents, he uses 2 Peter chapter 3 as the most convincing text he can find. But he misses out the first part and subtly changes the last part. So I'll read it as it really is. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. As we saw in episode 24, this prophecy is talking about the 19th century geologists like Charles Lyell, who desperately wanted to deny Noah's flood, so that they could interpret all the sediments laid down in the flood in terms of their so-called uniformity principle which says that nothing from the earliest time to which we can look back ever happened any differently to what we see happening now. This was specifically to deny Noah's flood. They could therefore interpret the sediments laid down in the flood as deposition over millions of years instead of just 100 days. This prophecy tells of the claim these scoffers would make that all things continue the same from the beginning of creation and the reason for this claim to deny Noah's flood. To say that this supports a pre-creation flood takes deliberate determination to ignore the plain meaning of Scripture. It had never been interpreted as referring to anything other than Noah's flood until the wisdom of this world persuaded theologians that they needed somehow to manufacture millions of years, just as Charles Lyle did. The other claims for scriptural support are equally pathetic. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its what? Cities. There were cities. When Lucifer was cast down, there were cities. They were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. 
Jeremiah is lamenting the catastrophic results of backsliding and turning away from the Lord by the Israelites. And as far as their cities are concerned, it specifically mentions Jerusalem. To pretend it refers to a pre-creation civilization shows how desperate is their attempt to manufacture support for the story. His other scriptures are no more convincing and he makes a mockery of the creation story. So the evening and the morning were the second day. You know, and, and once again, please, do your best to hold the tomatoes at this point in time. But what was really created on this day? Nothing. Everything was rearranged on this day. The firmament was apparently not created to divide the waters below from the waters above on the second day. In fact, according to him, on the second day, nothing was created. There's no firmament of the heavens, there's only the atmosphere. So how can God create the sun, moon and stars and set them in the firmament of the heaven on the fourth day? Well, he dodges that by stopping at day three. Presumably, the stretching out of the heavens would push the previous moon out of the way, unless the old creation didn't have a moon. And either the stretching out stopped before it reached the old sun, or the waters above the firmament extinguished the old sun. New stars would presumably made as the creation account tells us, on the fourth day, and the rest of the old universe would be beyond the waters above and outside the new universe. Unless there's another alternative in the mind of our theologian. There were no sun, moon and stars in the pre-creation creation. Such a universe obviously could not have supported any life as we know it, either plant or animal. In fact, the story is so pathetic, we might wonder why he's so determined to believe it. Well, he tells us why. You know, they think that we don't know anything, and, that, and Christians should be educated. You know, we send our kids off to school, and I've got several grandkids in college, and when they come back, and if, if I tell them that Everything that was created was created in, in six 24-hour periods, and before that there was nothing, and that outer space was just created old instantly. They start looking at Grandpa like Grandpa doesn't really know anything because they believe that they have scientific proof. And this, I believe, is the real reason for the story. And it takes me back to 35 years ago when two theology students asked me to give a lecture for their theology department. The only members of their department who came were the two students who invited me. There were people from just about every other department in the university, but none from theology. After the lecture, I asked the two students why. They said the staff told the students not to attend. They said, if we go against what the scientists say, we'll be laughed at and considered fools. How pathetic. Men holding the truth in their hands, bowing before the fallible reasoning of fallible men. For one, I'm not afraid of being considered a fool. And as far as my grandchildren are concerned, whether they've finished at college or university or haven't got there yet, I tell them the truth. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, Please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.